Blog Talk Radio. Hi, this is Christina Forrester with Christian Democrats of America, and this is the CDA Sunday Podcast Hour. We're continuing our Christians Against Hate series this week, and I'm so excited about today's podcast because we have a very special guest, author of The Gospel of Self, How Jesus Joined the GOP, Terry Heaton. Terry was a very important figure in the rising up of the 700 Club, working directly with Pat Robertson in the 1980s, and his book is extremely informative and eye-opening on the rise of the religious right and what's happening right now with Trump and the evangelical support. You know, a lot of us have been really um, amazed, and we talked about this for the last year, of how much evangelical support uh, Trump has had. And um, Terry's book is really eye-opening on that and on um, sort of the culture and the things that have led to this. So um, it's going to be a great conversation and really fascinating um, to get to talk with him. And so, so excited to have him today. Um, I just want to speak one moment about CDA and our um, announcement this week. If you have seen our article, it's also in Huffington Post and it's on our website and Facebook everywhere. Um, but it's about Christian Democrats getting off the Trump train and how I hope other Democrats will follow. I have a short video myself about it. And one means because a lot of people are like, wait, you were ever on the Trump train? And my response is yes, we have been. Democrats, progressives, we all have been for the past couple of years. And what it means is we've allowed him to dictate our reactions, to lead the narrative for far too long. And the entire 2016 elections were all about being against Trump. And we've heard so much political commentary on that in the last year. And the fact is it didn't pay off, and it's not paying off now. And, you know, the, a bully craves attention. And what we're doing is continuing to give him the attention. I, I realized that this week when Trump came to Phoenix and that his entire purpose was to be a puppet master. And we're being the puppets when we react and we give these things attention. Now, it's very difficult because there's a fine line. As we must report the truth, we have to keep on top of what's happening, and we have to take a definite stand against hate, racism, and the direction our country is going. So we know that. That's a given. And the fact is we can do that more effectively if we keep our focus off his tweets and off the bait that he puts out there instead of focusing on the culture wars and the PC outrages, uh, statues and tweets. We have to keep our eyes on doing the things and, and reporting on the things, talking about all the stuff Republicans have not done and economic justice and social justice. Because the fact is Republicans and Trump, they have not helped anyone. They've not done anything. Poverty is rising, homelessness is rising, unrest and hate crimes are rising across the country. And the GOP has really shown it cannot govern effectively. And if we're going to get back in control in 2018, we have to start focusing on those things and not take the bait that Trump and the alt-right are setting out there for us. So um, that's just my word. And, you know, something I really felt this week, and I believe that our new magazine, which also was announced this week. It's called The Progressive Gap. It's our first ever new magazine. It's going to be really the face of the Christian resistance. And it gives us a vehicle and a platform to be able to talk about these things and to be able to talk about some of the things I'm going to explore with Terry today, which are the underlying reasons and for what we have now and the Trump and the and the religious right and what has happened in our country and what's happening now. So we're going to be able to dig into these things and get off of this constant news cycle that Trump controls. And so I'm, ex I'm really excited to be able to share that with you this week. We're going to have the announcement. We're going to have the first cover that you can see as well as a new CDA website. <laughs> a website upgrade is needed, and I'm so excited we're finally getting it. And we're going to have a lot of cool new features um, that we can share with you and help you all connect and help Christian Democrats and progressives connect better across the country. So look for those announcements this week. Uh, keep an eye on things. Make sure that you're on our email list and watching social media so, um, so you can find out the 
first as soon as things are launched. Um, I also want to mention that if you can um, subscribe or if you're a CDA member, a monthly contributor, you will get a free subscription to the Progressive Gap. And there will be more details on that sent out in our newsletter as well. Um, and I, like I said, I can't wait to share the first cover story with you and some of the columns and contributors we have. It's really exciting. So um, that's all going to be within this next week. So um, just watch out for that. Uh, please remember that all of our efforts are grassroots. We are not funded by any outside group, no direct affiliations with the DNC or any millionaire, hedge fund, billionaires, none of that. So we need both volunteers and contributors to keep these things going, and we appreciate anything you can do to help us keep the podcast, the Christians Against Hate group, and all of our efforts moving. And um, we're working and we're growing, and um, it's an exciting time, and it's something our country needs right now more than ever, especially after the news of the past few days. Um, so I would, I'm excited to get into this with Terry. Um, so like I said, Terry is the author of the Gospel of Self, How Jesus Joined the GOP. And Terry, I've been highlighting this book and I've been pouring through it and I've been making notes because there's just so much in it that has resounded with me. So welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much for uh... Uh, inviting me, I'm you know I'm delighted to sit here and and speak with you. Awesome. Well, before we get into the book and all the stuff I want to talk to you about, um, I would like to know just your reaction um, about this weekend and what has already happened, and um, the fact that you know we have a uh, weather crisis on our hands, a hurricane crisis. And during that exact time, the president chooses to um, ban transgender people from the military and pardon Joe Arpaio, who has spent decades terrorizing Latinos in Arizona and um, putting forth really harsh policies that are, by most accounts, inhumane for many decades. So, um, and so we have all this, and. The fact is there are still a lot of Christian people and churches who are supporting this president through everything that's happened right. this last couple of weeks. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, nothing, uh, nothing that has happened or will happen surprises me. It's, uh, mm. and, and that's, I think, pretty important. You just, you know, we're dealing with a, a guy who's, you know, not entirely there and, uh, you know, regardless of what, he represents in the minds of uh, normally sane people. Um, we have we have an obligation, I think, to keep uh, you know resisting and uh, keeping uh, our minds open and trying. I think, Christina, to enter into dialogue with other Christians because we're not going to win this argument on political grounds, and and that's what's mm -hmm. so important to me that. The um, you know what, back in uh, in my days as executive producer of the Seven Hundred Club, what we did was was move Christianity into the political arena, and you know ever since then that's what we've been you know fighting, uh, and and I don't I just don't think um, that we're going to win. Uh, the the battle there. And by the way, I, I do think uh, that Donald Trump is supposed to be in the White House. I, uh, you know, it's pretty hard uh, for me to deny that, but I would, you know, where I split off from others who may be saying that is uh, with regards to the reason um, that I think he's in there, which is, uh, you know, you know, God's a, uh, God's a funny fellow. He, you know, um, uh, he, he he raises up people and puts them down, and you know, all for our benefit. So I think, you know, we have a chance here, um, at, right at this time and in the uh, years to come, to uh, to come against some of the divisiveness that exists in our uh, surrounding world, and and I think that would be a good thing. So. 
But I don't think we're going to argue. I don't think we're going to win any of these arguments on you know uh, purely political grounds. Uh, I think we need to. I need to. I think we need to be looking for commonalities that we have with our evangelical you know brethren who are over there on the right. Um, I think we need to be um, you know speaking as Christians, you know, in a culture that really. Uh, is dealing with a uh, a brand of religion, you know. That, by that I mean Christianity that has been, for the most part, hijacked by uh, a political group. And mm. you know, I, I played I played a major role in making that happen. And uh, you know that's why, honestly, I wrote the book. I was uh, uh, funny story. I was I was driving home. This is in uh, 2015, I was driving home from Birmingham and listening to sports talk radio, and there's a fellow who broadcasts here in Alabama named Paul Feinbaum. He now works for ESPN, but he's generally considered a an Alabama treasure, and uh, he has a very big um, audience in the South, and, uh, you know, a lot of his callers are, you know, what you would, you know, you may... Um, think of as rednecks, but, uh, uh, mm. you know, he, he has a way of handling that, them that's really uh, fascinating. So anyway, I'm listening to the radio program, and this guy named Reggie, who is a regular caller, uh, calls in and says, Paul, Paul, you ain't going to believe what I just heard. There's this <laughs> man named Donald Trump, got to be the smartest human being on the planet. He's a billionaire, Paul. And uh, he's going to be president. And so I, I heard that. And, uh, of course, being in the, the news business all my life, I was, you know, very much aware of Donald Trump and who Donald Trump was. But it was that phone call on the Paul Feinbaum show that, uh, that made that it was the last straw to uh, convict me that I needed to publish this book. Um, mm. Because, I, you know, I... I um, I mean, I, I could go on and on and on about this stuff, Christina. So, uh, you know, but I was convicted that I needed to, you know, write what I felt was a wrong that I participated in in the 1980s mm -hmm. uh, as Pat Robertson's right hand man for television. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I. Uh, well, it really we confirmed we so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it really confirmed so much that we've been talking about for the last seven years or so with um, Christian Democrats in America that we've been observing um, and in the way that this rose up. So when I read a lot of the things I in your book, I just, yeah, that, that's exactly what we've seen and what we sus suspected about how the religious right and this entire movement began. Um, and, you know, a lot of us millennials like myself, you know, we just we grew up in the 80s or the 90s, where it was already established. And so right. I've talked to people, you know, talked to my parents and things, and, and other people who say, oh, well, in the 70s, you know, it was no big deal. You could just say, you know, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian and a Democrat, and no one thought anything about it. In fact, right. when I was a guest on the 700 Club on a segment um, a few years ago, uh, there was uh, someone who actually said that to me, that, that you know, it wasn't shouldn't be a big deal to be a Christian or Democrat, and it didn't used to be. Um, and it was kind of awkward because I realized, well, you know, it's your program that kind of helped make that happen. So now it's like a people in the Christian community, so many consider it an oxymoron. But I, I right. that's something I I was want to ask you as you were talking. You know, I agree we have to find middle ground and. Let's just take abortion even, for instance. Um, that's something I've been trying to do for about seven years, trying to talk about, hey, we're not really that far apart on abortion. We all want to decrease the amount of abortions. And it's not like Democrats are over here saying, hey, we want to, you know, murder more babies or something like that. There's, there's a common ground we want to reduce, and there's things we can do that promote both life and choice that give women – choice but also protect life so there's there are ways we can have a compromise if there was a willingness but you know when i just speaking on that when i was on the 700 club 
there was this feeling almost like of shock that there were Christian Democrats represented there. And, you know, you're more experienced in this. This was the world, you know, that you, that you started. So I'm real interested to hear what do you think we can actually do with compromise and moderation? Because that's what I was talking about on the program. And you know what I got back from most viewers and from most people I would say 80%, and, and that's been the case for seven years with Christian Democrats of America. I'd say 80% of Christians from the other side don't want to talk. They don't want to compromise. They come on to our social media, and they say, you are murderers. You are blasphemers. You are going to hell. You want to the, – the platform has nothing to do with Christianity. It's like they've read – all read the same script, and they're all coming from some script. And I've thought over the years after reading literally thousands of these, are these people all reading one book? And then they come to us with the same, <laughs> with the same thing because it's like a record constantly, and you can't get past it because anything you talk about and you try to talk about compromise or moderation or, no, see it from our side. That's all you get is you're going to hell, you're murderers, there's nothing Christian about you, you can't be a Christian. That's all we hear. So how do you get past that? Well, first of all, you have to remember that not all of the knees out there have bowed down to the false god of uh, Republican, uh, right-wing Republicanism. And uh, just the fact mm -hmm. that you mentioned uh, the, the uh, astonishment over the idea of Christian Democrats, um, that gives you, in my judgment, an open door. The, the, the problem is you're going to be tagged liberal. And, uh, you know, liberal is means the same thing to these people as Satan. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, have a, you have a tough road in overcoming that. But just, you know, I don't even know what liberal means anymore. And... Uh, other than it's just highly, highly pejorative uh, attack word that uh, mm -hmm. you know people on that people on the right politically. Now remember this: this is politically. People on the right politically use to um, vilify uh, anybody who disagrees with them. So it, you know, you have to approach it from a spiritual perspective. You know. Uh, when you hear, you know, for example, the Donald Trump uh, and a lot of these evangelical Christians, uh, you know, they they hate the man's Twitter feed. They uh, they don't like uh, a lot of the policies that he's uh, enacting. They they don't think it's he's really necessarily uh, responding to the needs that they expressed, uh, you know, a while ago, and that he picked up on the campaign trail. Um, but they do believe that he's put there by God. And, uh, you know, they use the biblical example of King Cyrus that, uh, that God used, you know, to free the Jews in Babylon and send them back to build the, or rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So they, they see right in front of them in the Bible a story of an unrighteous king that God used for a righteous purpose, and they cling to that, and cling to that, and cling to that. And so, if you're if you're prepared to talk about that, you know maybe you can you can do some good. But you know, as long as you try to you know enter into arguments with them, you know politically, I, I just don't see how you're going to break through. Um, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I wrote the book. I have a uh, I'm in Colorado Springs this weekend and have a, uh, you know, a speaking engagement with, uh, you know, a bunch of conservatives, and it's going to be, it's a very intimate gathering, but it's it's going to be fascinating because I'm I'm directly speaking to, you know, the people that you uh, would reference as the enemy, and uh, you know we've just got to get we've got to get this enemy you know idea out of our heads because. You know, we're being manipulated by forces, uh, you know, who are much greater than our, than us and who have, mm. you know, self-serving self intentions. And, uh, you know, I'm so delighted to hear you say that yours is a grassroots effort because grassroots is where it's at. 
Um, mm-hmm. I've written a lot about I've written a lot about the the horizontal church, and the horizontal church to me is where the web is going to eventually take us. Um, you know, the network is going to take us because we are all connected in ways we never have been before. You know, if you mm-hmm. examine the history the history of the church, um, the church is entirely a a mass marketing vehicle. Um, when Wy- when um, Wycliffe wrote the first uh, common English translation of the Bible, he was immediately, you know, excommunicated and made an enemy of the church. And then uh, when the printing press came along and a, a Bible, for crying out loud, was actually printed, um, that really uh, chafed the ruling, you know, authorities of the church. I mean, it it uh, it gutted their fatted calf, and so they fought against mm. it uh, tooth and nail, and wanted you know to uh, nobody could print a Bible unless it was licensed by Rome. Well, that didn't work, mm. and uh, a priest at the time once said, "The jewel of the elites, which I believe to be knowledge, the jewel of the elites is in the hands of the laity," and uh, the web is really the second Gutenberg moment in history. And uh, and once again, the jewel of the elites is in the hands of the laity. And the question for us is, what are we going to do with it? Uh, mm-hmm. So we have a way, you know, because horizontal communications um, are, are much more efficient than top-down. And yet we have all of these right. entities think, thinking that uh, top-down is still the way to go. I mean, the church has been involved in every major mass media um, innovation since time began. Uh, even, you know, satellites. Uh, two of the first ten uh, transponders on the original SATCOM-1 satellite were, were owned by Christian organizations, uh, evangelical mm-hmm. Christian organizations. <laughs> so they saw the value of the satellite you know, my goodness, what would be a better metaphor for preaching than from a satellite high above the world preaching down onto everybody? Well, mm. the, the, you have to. You have, if you look around, you'll notice that in terms of horizontal activity, the church is nowhere to be found, and that's because it doesn't it doesn't fit the the top down hierarchical. Uh, mechanism that is the church, and uh, you know, my goodness, what what are all of what is the church going to do if people at the ground level actually get together? <coughs> oh my goodness, that's uh, that, that's terribly disruptive, and and so that's I think where we're at. We're just at the dawn of all of that, and we need to discuss these issues from a uh, Christian perspective a genuine Christian perspective instead of a right-wing political perspective because that's what we did at, at CBN. We we made them, we made those issues political. Uh, we claimed we were offering a bi- biblical perspective to the world, but we, really we were offering a right-wing Republican perspective to the world. And if you don't think so, mm-hmm. then ask yourself, why, why would Pat Robertson run for president in 1988? For crying out loud, um, mm. and all that went with all that went with that, and uh, you know, I, I need to say that I, you know, there still is a just an enormous degree of love in my heart for Pat. Uh, I mean, when my wife died ten years ago, he was one of the very first people to call me that morning, and uh, mm. and 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 to pray with me. So you know. I, you know, I think these people are just, they're just terribly misguided, you know, and uh, right. plus plus they've been led, you know, uh, down the road with this whole right-wing Christianity thing. And uh, let me say also that we, we set out at the 700 Club to change the world. I mean, that was our mission. That was mm. our intent. Uh, we were not silent in any way about it. Uh, and and we, we began with a Gallup poll about uh, attitudes towards Christians in America. 
and as you can imagine, the uh, the thoughts and the words used to describe Christians uh, by the by the public were almost entirely pejorative. They were, you know, it's like mm. uh, they're overweight, overweight, polyester wearing, southern, ignorant, <laughs> Bible thumping, you know, hicks. Just like that wow. guy who called Paul. Just like that guy who called Paul. And and wow. so we. So we set about in uh, at the Seven Hundred Club to to pitch a form of Christianity that was actually quite contrary, and we did that through marketing methodologies. We never we never went near anybody that fit the stereotype. We just wouldn't. And you know, uh, cameramen in the studio were not were were directed and trained not to show those kinds of people. You know, sitting in the audience, we were after young, upscale, you know, good-looking, uh, prosperous, uh, you know, people that we wanted to present the image that this was really, uh, these were really God's people. And if you aspired to be one, you know, you could be just like them. And uh, well, you know, so, so so I just want to, yeah, I, I want to pick up on that real quick because I um. We've heard that about, you know, certain broadcasting networks and other Christian, you know, Christian um, TV shows and things. I know a lot of our viewers and our our members at CDA have, have talked to me about this. Of, you know, you'll you'll notice and, and you'll hear that, yeah, they they ask the the most well dressed people to come up front to be in the audience shot, and I've seen this happen before as well. And the I. Do you think that was sort of the beginning or the underpinnings of what became really the prosperity, known as the prosperity movement and the prosperity gospel and the whole uh, gross doctrine of somehow the richer and the better you look the and the more stylish you are, the more godly you are? Well, d- absolutely. And, uh, you know, mm. the uh, the problem, here's what happened, though, in the in the 80s while we were doing this and having great success with it by the way by the way you know in 1984 mm. we did two, we did 248 million dollars in in tax deductible contributions i mean that's an mm. extraordinary amount of money i mean there are days when you know over a million dollars came in uh, in the mail wow uh, so we were very successful with that the problem happened when the uh scandals involving the televangelists uh, occurred when uh, when Oral Roberts said he needed nine million dollars or the Lord was going to take him home. Uh, when uh, mm. Jim Baker got into his uh, tryst with uh, uh, I can't remember her name right now, but uh, um, I, never mind anyway. Uh, uh, and that whole thing involving his ministry at PTL and Jerry Falwell and and that that mm. scandal and then. And then Jimmy Swaggart and his, you know, his run-ins with prostitutes and, you know, his whole ministry right. coming down. CDN was never a part of any of those scandals, and yet it uh, it really badly impacted um, contributions. Uh, and, mm. the, and a lot of the a lot of the intelligent um, viewers and uh, listeners and partners. Thought you know maybe I'm, I need to take a uh, step away from this for a minute. And uh, so what 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 does that leave if those people go? That leaves the the stereotype, and uh, and, and that's I think an under you know uh, discussed uh, factor in all of our efforts to contribute to the growth of the Republican Party and the moving of that political party to the right. Um, Hmm. And and so and so yes, there is a stereotype that exists, but not all, you know. And uh, you know, the real question to me uh, while writing the book is always how do, how do how do you convince people who are in you know in dire straits actually economically, socially, how do you convince them to align with the party of the wealthy? And uh, you know, because before the seven hundred club, before you know the Christian right. Uh, the South was generally, um, you know, conservative Democrats. 
you know, the blue dog mm. Democrats came late, later. But, right. but, you know, there, there were no Republican strongholds in the South, none. They were all conservative Democrats. And, and so, you know, that was a major shift in the political world. And why, again, I say that you're not going to, you know, you're not going to talk to these people or argue with these people on a political level. It's just not going to happen. Um, you know, and we haven't even begun to discuss CBN News and the creation of uh, the right-wing press uh, because that's right. a, yeah. a major, major part of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of an all-encompassing, um, I mean, they own, you know, Radio Wave, they own pretty much Christian media altogether. And that's been why it's been one of our visions to um, to develop our own you know, media as a go. It's it's um but tough when they have a string of churches um all locked in. I mean in it was several were shocked to find out, you know, there was something like, you know, over two hundred or maybe it was two thousand, I can't remember, um, churches that showed Mike Pence um the the Sunday before the election. <laughs> An right. special address right. from him. Um, and so, so yeah, getting back to, yeah, I mean, how do we, and you talk about, okay, so you're talking about talking with these people on a spiritual level, um, how, again, we, when we do this and, and I've been on panels and I've been around and, and, um, and tried to, um, you know, find some kind of common ground and things. And it's really hard when, when there's, the camps are so divided, and right. when it when the conversation starts out, you are not a Christian, <laughs> just a fought out judgment. Well, and you try to point out, well, you're judging us. You know that's judgment. What you're doing, you can't judge me. And then it goes to, but you believe in murder. You know, so it's almost like there's no there's no discussion. There's no compromise. That's it. You're not a Christian because you vote for Democrats and you're murder. And that's when I started Christian Democrats of America, that was one of the first goals was to give people, I heard the only voices I heard speaking for Christianity were voices talking about things that I was not even raised our right. Christian values, <laughs> you know, right. and my, my grandmother was an evangelist and a, and my dad and my mom are pastors. And, you know, I've come from a ministry family and the things I was hearing and I've heard through the years coming from, the mouths of who's supposed to represent Christianity don't even reflect Jesus at right. all. So right. that's been trying to point that out though. Um, the, all that you have in return are just these talking points. And it's like, everybody has right. these talking points memorized. <laughs> that's, they can't get past right. it. Well, yeah. I think you have to take the position that, uh, that you're not a part of either side. In this in this mm. argument, in these political arguments, you're you're just not you're not uh, you're not uh, a part of the far right, and you're not a part of the far left. You know, you're Christians, mm. and and right. uh, and then and then state your positions. You know, if you wish. You know, let me let me tell you something that I I, I strongly believe in regarding abortion, and uh, I I kind of have taken you know the. Uh, um, the position of William F. Buckley, but it's really a moral issue, and here's why. You know, abortion isn't about killing babies. It's about, and I'll use it, uh, a clean term rather than the one that I would really like to use, uh, but it's about sex. That's what it's about. It, abortion is about sex. You know, it, it's not about uh, killing babies, because if it was about killing babies, then the uh, the right would be very satisfied with what's happening today because we are now, if you look at the abortion numbers, we are now below where we were when Roe v. Wade uh, became law. So yes, if 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 that's true, in, in fact, then, then yes, in fact, under Obama, it was the lowest level that it's ever been. I just had to check <laughs> that yeah, under Obama, and, and, it, went, it went low. Right, and and why is that? That's because of very um, successful efforts with uh, education and especially birth control. 
So, you know, and when you start to talk to certain Christians about birth control, you know, you, you get a, oh, well, you know, but oh, you can't do that. And, uh, <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, that's the hypocrisy of the whole abortion argument, you know, and, you know, but it, they keep repeating the same talking points over and over and over again because the issue isn't about abortion, it's about sex. And uh, mm. th- that's the moral uh, dilemma that, that certain right-wing Christians um, are obsessed with sex, and uh, you know, and just don't want to talk about it, uh, even though that's the real issue. It's it's abortion as birth control. You know, uh, you know, I I just went through a thing personally with my daughter and a uh, just a horrible horrible personal situation that she had to go through with a baby who was diagnosed um, with severe uh, genetic problems and uh, Mm. at 20 weeks at 20 weeks and so you know she oh dear you know bless her heart she she stuck with it you know and uh, I was really proud of her for that but there came a point in the third trimester where the body said no and uh, and naturally started separating the placenta from, you know, the baby because the body knew that there was something wrong. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you know, I, I, what is an abortion in the third trimester? It's called a C-section, you know, and, uh, you know, so she had a C-section. The baby lived for six hours, and uh, but it, you know, I couldn't. I, honestly, I I hate to say this, uh, but it was very hard to even look at that baby. Um, mm-hmm. And and so so I have personal up close and personal experience with that whole business. And you know, uh, the problem is the right doesn't want to talk about that kind of thing. You know, they want to talk about, you know, the the mere suggestion that a perfect baby, you know, could even be aborted in the the ninth month is absurd. It's just absurd, and yet that talking point exists out there. So abortion to me, Christina, is in in fact the issue is not abortion, it's sex. And, uh, you know, just like uh, the whole transsexual or homosexual thing. It's it's not about, you know, violation of covenants. It's about sex. And uh, you know, we're just we're just way behind where we should be in our willingness to discuss those kinds of things. Um and, yeah, and yeah, that we, you know that we, you're the what, first what, person I've heard say that. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's the truth. Uh, and, and so, you know, do I think that abortion is wrong? Of course. I mean, I, you know, my daughter wouldn't, wouldn't do an abortion at 20 weeks, and I understood that. I understood her desire. And uh, I've known so many people who have had abortions and, uh, you know, have, have different thoughts as the years have gone by about it. So morally, the, the, the judgment is very easy for me. However, it's not a legal issue. The moment you try to inject the law into it, one way or the other, you've got problems. You know, it's a, mm. it's a decision, frankly, that belongs with the mother and uh, her doctor and right. her family, and and, uh, right. and that's fine with that's fine with me. It's uh, but again, like yeah. you say, it's, it's just a, it's a it's a talking point that is used, you know, by other people to beat you up with because you might be. Oh my God, a liberal, you know, and so I don't. I, I think you need to stay away. I think I think you need to stay away from both extremes, you know, and, and right. just say, look, we're just we're just Christians, and uh, and and I want to, you know, I really want to take this some time to encourage you too, because there's there's more going on in the world than you realize. Um, there is. I heard a. Uh, I was at a conference in January, and I heard numbers from uh, that Southern Baptists are losing uh, by the time they're losing 80% of the membership 
that reaches the age of 18. Um, that's an astonishing and shocking number. Uh, but it wow. meshes with, with the things that I see. There is a, an enormous thirst for something meaningful that's out there right now. There are a lot of very good people who are trying to tap it, you know, and of course the right would think that, well, that means that there's a big revival coming. Well, it may indeed be a big revival, but it's not going to be of your ilk because people are fed right. up with it, you know, the, of the hypocrisy yeah. of the whole thing. And uh, so if you if you follow people like um, like uh, uh, the guy I just love is David Hayward, the uh, naked pastor. Um, he's a cartoonist and, uh, you know, an artist, but he also runs, a, you know, a website for people who have left the church. And, uh, you know, I think, you, you know, when you start asking questions about people who've left the church, um, you know, you, you will get an earful about uh, stuff that you have hoped you would hear but have really haven't heard. Uh, and there mm -hmm. are a lot of those people. They're looking for something, and uh, the smart person is going to come along and offer it and, uh, you know, and be, I think, very successful. In uh, And it will probably be in some sort of uh, horizontal uh, connectivity thing. Um, so, you know, because it, you just can't help when you, when you get into hierarchies, you just, the temptation for you know, mischief is just too great. You know, and we as human hmm. beings, you know, we, we can't we can't avoid it. So, um, you know, uh, well, it seems one thing that oh, sorry, one thing that you said uh, just um, reminded me of something you said in your book about how um, right now, you know, they're the the people in you know supporting Trump and the GOP for a long time now are not even voting in their best interest. And that's something we, we've tried to point out a lot right. at CDA is how, you know, you have people here in, in, the, in the South and the people who have, who have been Trump supporters and GOP supporters. And, you know, I've seen this even in, you know, distant family and friends of my own where they're people who really need the services and use the services that Democrats support and the things that Democrats want to do to lift up people in poverty and provide the social safety net and help decrease homelessness and all of these things that, you know, a lot of these people really are for. They, they want that, but yet they continue to vote out of their best interest. And it's as if, you know, there's some kind of spiritual duty in it. And you talk about that in your book. And you also mentioned that as like the angry mob. And I'm wondering, is that mob like what we see at Trump rallies? And also where is, uh, why do people continue to believe the propaganda? Because I've seen the stories and, you know, talking about abortion, going you know, all across the board, we just see this propaganda, propaganda. And it paints right. women who, like your daughter, you know, who have had medical issues, and, you know, I think it's something like 90% of abortions that are of a later trimester or more, maybe it's 99%, they're mostly all medically related of some kind. And, right. and we have to have compassion for that. And I can't believe that these people don't have compassion if, if it's a family member, but yet they see this propaganda that, oh, Democrats want abortions for all, and somehow what, we just want to kill babies for the fun of it? I mean, that's almost what is betrayed. So how do we get them to not see this propaganda for what it is? And, and is it, like you said, this angry mob that develops? Well, I think, you know, again, I want to encourage you because Democrat isn't the pejorative word. Liberal pejorative word. You know, liberals mm. are the ones are the ones who have taken you know, from the working class and, uh, you know, given it to the poor people. Uh, you know, liberals are the ones uh, who, you know, who want to continue to take, take, take. And, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, what you're dealing with in terms of propaganda. I, uh, mm. I, strong, I strongly uh, agree, agree with your use of that word. And, uh, you know, and I've, 
I've studied a lot of that in my life because I'm interested in it. You know, we what we did was create um, in CBN News. We created a a political propaganda machine, and that's mm. you know plain and simple. That's what it was. We wrote the playbook that Fox copied. You know, uh, right? And it was because if you can present political propaganda as news then, you know, you accomplish a great many things, including forcing um, the news that are that is not, you know, political propaganda into a defensive uh, posture. And they, you know, they've been very successful that, with, with that. And it's easy. It's very easy to do. I think what Democrats need to do is to get back to Geez, I've just written a, a new piece for the Huffington Post that will be published next week, uh, and I've talked about my father. My dad was an, uh, a staunch labor guy. He grew up in the furniture factories of western Michigan, and uh, he hated, hated Republicans. Why? Because they were the party of the rich, the silk stockings, mm. the, guys, the guys who, uh, you know, lorded it over you know, the working class. And I think that Democrats have lost that, you know, you know, have, have lost mm-hmm. that weapon. That this is the party of the wealthy. And what have they to do with you? You know, that's, that's a right. fair discussion. And, and, uh, you know, and so hopefully, you know, the, you know, the Democrats will, you know, take up a different, you know, reject the label liberals, you know, it, it's it's made up anyway. It's an artificial, you know, pejorative term that is equated with the devil. And of course, you're not going to win an argument being positioned as the devil. You're just not going to, you know. <laughs> so you know, it's right. it's like it's like you need to come up with five or six talking points that that uh, assign you know to the Republican Party the traditional label of being the party of the rich. And uh, and ask those people out in the, the you know middle America states, you know who um, who have fallen for you know the flim flam um, or a flim flammery of I'm going to return manufacturing jobs to uh, to you and everything's going to be fine because we're going to make America great again. What a bunch of bullshit that is! And uh, excuse my <laughs> French, but but uh, you know that that's you know. Where in in that whole conversation is automation being discussed? You know, because automation right. is a much greater threat to people with manufacturing backgrounds than it, than our you know Democrats. So it's right. it's like um, if if the you know the Democrats need to be the party of you know retraining and re you know uh, you know uh, you know being on the front end of uh, you know holograms and and automation and all of the, you know, new technological future. And, uh, you know, just simply don't, you know, what we need to do, Christine, is we need to stop reacting. You know, yeah. uh, we're, we're in a the, defensive position. You know, we're the, mm-hmm. we're the batter at the plate who's expecting to get hit by the pitch. You know, we're, right. and we a, can't possibly, we can't possibly swing for the fences because we think we're going to get hit. You know, that's yeah, that's a, not helping. That's such a uh, confirmation of the direction even this week that um, I was really led to after Trump, and, and I said at the top of the um, podcast here, and it, there's an article you know, on our website now and um, an article I have on Huffington Post on this saying it's time for Democrats to get off the Trump train because that's right. where we've yeah. been. and. And we've been reacting to him. We've been allowing him to make dictate our reactions. And it's just like a bully. And my mom taught me when I was a kid, don't give control to the bullies. Don't let them have power over you and keep reacting to them. If you stop that, then you take their power away. And I I think that's where the left is at. Where And, you know, it's hard to not react when the bait is out there. And, and it's so... Outrageous, and there's so much. Yeah, I know. I, I'm but as guilty the, as anybody, you know, of reacting. But, in the, in the, but it, to win, 
to win elections, yeah, but like you said, we have to focus on the economic message and the truth about what Republicans are not doing and what Trump right. is not doing and what we can do to help people. Yep, and, uh, you know, to all the people who have it made, um, you know, that's, you know, there's a, there's always self-interest in politics and, uh, you know, uh, you know, wanting, if you have a lot of money and you want more, you know, more power to you, but that's not, you know, that's not the message that you find in the red words of the Bible. And, uh, right. you know, I, I did a, I wrote a piece um, last autumn after, I mean, I, I got both the uh, party platforms side by side and studied them. And, you know, you would be hard pressed, I think, honestly, hard pressed for for Christians who really have any sense of compassion in their bones or any sense of uh, the, the teachings of our Lord, uh, you would be hard pressed for them to not uh, find those words in the, in the party platform of the Democrats. Uh, and yet, and, and there are, they are nowhere near the, the party platform of the Republicans. It was just night and exactly. day. And, and so, exactly. you know, but all of that is lost in this propaganda machine. And, yes. you know, the, let's face it, Donald Trump is naturally gifted at logical fallacies. And so, mm. you know, it, it, and, and every time that gets thrown out there, we feel an obligation to refute it. And we're done mm -hmm. at that point. We're just done. We're, we are, as you say, we are. We are riding the Trump train, and, you know, I, I have come to believe in my life, uh, Christina, that, that human beings are responsible for their actions, but we are also responsible for our reactions, and that's mm. where we get fooled. That's where we get fooled the most, and so, you know, it's not, I don't want to say that, uh, that the Sheriff Joe is irrelevant. But in a, to a certain extent, he is. You know, uh, you know, it's we 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 are not going to win anybody's or change anybody's mind by arguing uh, against a guy like that and against uh, Trump for you know pardoning him. And <coughs> excuse me, we've we just got a much bigger uh, we got a much bigger um, battle to fight. It's kind of like you know Game of Thrones. We've got this. You know, this mm -hmm. big coming war that we see, you know, but, you know, others don't because they're, they're, they're interested in ruling the land. But, uh, you know, we say, no, mm -hmm. this whole death thing is, this is coming, you know, and death is the enemy. And so, you know, let's fight it and, and let's be Christians. There's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with it. You know, there's, and, and there's nothing wrong w with, with being a Christian and calling yourself somebody who's interested in the poor and the afflicted. You know, I mean, I mm. mean, if, if, yeah, and that's just the truth. You know, um, you know, it's, that's why I call it the gospel of self. When, you know, we taught the gospel of self-help You know, that's what we've done. It's, uh, you know, and, you know, Oh, Terry, we, uh, we got a technical, we can't, you know, based upon certain teachings of... Uh, out of Can't hear you very well, Terry. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, and so I think we have a generation now that has been, you know, bred and raised on the gospel of self. And that if God is judging the world, he is, uh, in any way, shape, or form, he is judging the church first. And, uh, you know, I think... Um, you know, we, we we tend to, you know, I would say right-wing Christians tend to view, uh, you know, God's activity in the world today as judging the United States, you know, for its sin. But uh, I, I don't see that as the case. God is judging the church. And, you know, mm. you had better be prepared, you know, dear church, for that judgment. And uh, I think mm. there's a message there, a Christian message there. That can resonate too. Um, you know what the right. what these right wing propaganda, political propaganda people don't want is a discussion of you know 
a real discussion of what it means to be a Christian. And uh, mm. whoops. Yeah, and that's that's probably why we've been um, fought so much when we do put up. You know, it's amazing to me that. You know, we'll get we'll put up a scripture and it'll get you know three four hundred shares, and that scripture then will um, will actually get people who are saying that they're Christians and arguing with us just over the scripture we posted. <laughs> they don't. They, it's it's as if with some circles, and that's not with everybody, of course, but with some circles, it's as if the word of God itself is they just they don't want to see it, and it's because so many of these and control, like you're talking about, have used just these few cherry-picked verses and focused on just that, and that's all we, and that's all that they know and that they hear. So it is, um, yeah, it is so important. That's why um, I'm so excited that we're getting, you know, this magazine and, and things started, and that's was the vision for that, is that we can start focusing on some of these broader topics and get off of the Trump train. And focus on what well, we need to, the, and talk about these things. Right, because there's, there, you know, I uh, I encourage you. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm really happy that that you're doing what you're doing. This is a very important um, thing that you're doing, and uh, you know, it's it's, you know, how do you avoid, you know, getting being on the defensive? Well, you, the mm-hmm. way you do that is by, by playing offense. You need to have a strategy, uh, and you need to just go for it. And, and I think that you're, you're on the cusp of something that's very important, and uh, you and your followers and your supporters, you know, need to be encouraged. And I, I applaud you uh, because it's not uh, the easier, softer way. You know, life is hard, but it's hard for everybody. And... Uh, it, you know, it's it's not just you know the, there's no room uh, in life really for self pity, and that's what you know that's what the this uh, this whole movement of the the Christian right, if you will, of the evangelical Christian right, has uh, you know has prompted. Uh, it's like it's okay for you to feel sorry for yourself because look what these people have done to you. You know, they've taken away you know mm. your job they've taken away you know your uh, tax money they you know you deserve better you know and you know boy i hate that word deserve because it's just loaded with the uh, potential you know negativity and mischief so uh mm. you know i don't i don't deserve anything you know and i'm i'm very happy with that and uh you know I, I, there's so much more that we could talk about um you know, oh, there is. Yeah, no, we're you, we're. You, you've got to be running out of time, right? <laughs> we're about at two minutes. Yeah. So, I mean, I just want to thank thank you so much. Thank you so much for the encouragement, for your wisdom, and sharing your experiences with us and with the world. And I, I just want to tell all of our members, you know, please get this book. Like it, it will. It's something that we all need to read, that, that you need to see, and it's, it's, I think it's really important. It's, you, you did this at the right time, Terry. I'm so glad that you yeah. did and that you're telling your story. It, it's really the right time. Um, so please pick up a copy of the book. We'll have a link um, to this, to the book, directly on our website. And, Terry, I hope you'll come back and do another podcast, do a, um, an interview, um, anything with us at any time. We would love of to course. have you back and talk to you more. Of There's course. so much more to talk about. I feel like we just barely scratched the surface here. Um, so well, thank I, I'm you. Writing um, we, I, I'm, I'm writing weekly for the Huffington Post, so that's another place to find uh, my Great. commentary. Great. Well, we'll have a link. We'll post, post a link to that as well. And um, post some of those absolutely and share some of that on our uh, social media. So um, thank you. And I just want to tell everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, Watch for announcements. Please take a look at our uh, website this week. Watch for announcements on the progressive gap and consider joining the movement. We are um, we're moving forward and uh, this is an important time right now. Um, I just want to leave you with a scripture. It's Sunday. So let's end on a scripture. Luke 6, 45, the good man brings good things out of the good treasure of his heart, 
and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil treasure of his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, amen. Thank you guys so much. God bless.